All right, good to go. Phew. Okay. Um, yeah, so we open this, so we create this RDT object um, and send and receive. Um, now, um, okay, so to answer your question right away, um, you would basically, instead of using this RDT 1.0, um, you would call your own RDT functions. So inside the RDT uh, class, um, there is the RDT 1.0 and RDT 1.0 send and receive. Mm -hmm. And then you can basically, you know, <laughs> you can copy this code over <laughs> to here and that code over to here, and you're going to have RDT 1.0 functionality. And then you can expand that functionality with um, to, to deal RDT. with active corruption, et cetera. Sure. Okay, that makes sense. Thank so then you. One thing I want to add is once you have oh. RDT going, mm -hmm. then inside it, um, you'll see you starting a network layer as an object. And then when you're doing send, you're doing you're calling the network layer UDT send. And then you have the network and this basically opens a socket to the server. And do we need to create a new network layer for RDT two and three, or is that one? You do not. Okay. You do not. That's the that's the beauty of it, in that um, your RDT just gets more and more powerful, but all of them will call UDT send. Okay. Now, what you do have to do in the network layer is to test RDT two point one. Um, you need to enable uh, packet corruption. Okay. So um, you can set this to basically something between zero and one, right? It's probability of byte of byte corruption. Um, okay. Otherwise, you will be running on a reliable UDT network channel, and so um, yeah, because you're not going to know if your stuff works. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then do we uh, do we need to adjust packet loss as well and the reorder as well when we're um, adjusting those? Yeah. I if if I remember correctly, uh, back the byte corruption is for um, RDT two point one, and packet mm -hmm. loss is for three point zero. Okay, great. Um, so first you do this one, then you do both, um, and then reorder is only for the bonus. Okay, so perfect. Don't touch reorder. This will make it. This is somewhat difficult. Yeah, <laughs> so I can imagine. Touch it. It's just there for for those who want to uh, get deeper into it. Cool. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, thanks. I think that that certainly answers that question. I appreciate it. Great. Thanks for um, thanks for asking your question. Yeah. Um, Plenty. Can, can I see the chat? Okay. Any other questions? No questions. Okay. Great. Um, if um, all right. If there's some of you that um have not opened the assignment yet or you're just getting started, um, please come to uh, the office hours today and at least like shadow that like people are talking about. This will be helpful to you. Um, or, you know, if, even if you just opened the assignment and you want to come to like my, you know, private office hours, schedule seven assignments, uh, sorry, schedule yourself a slot and just, um, if nothing else, just read through the assignment with me. And I'm, I'm available to you. I want to make sure you guys aren't um, stuck on things. I don't want you to be stuck on. I want you to be stuck on when you're like uh, implementing some part of your protocol and it's not working, and then you're trying to figure out how to, you know, get the code to be correct. But um, that's like where your creativity happens. If you have sort of blockage on how to get started or even where to start changing things, um, talk to me, and uh, I'll, I'll. Uh, Make that make the ramp a little a little uh, less steep for you. All right. Um, so let me share something else, um, which is the slides. All right. If I did this, can you guys see like the full screen slides? Yes. Great. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. I wasn't sure this was going to work. Um, all right. So um, today I want to start getting into congestion control, which is um, 
a very core thing to networking. It's a very core principle. Um, we'll talk about different flavors of TCP. Um, it's It can seem like a lot of kind of minute detail. Um, and one of the homework questions asked you guys to um, kind of work with that level of detail and sass, sass out what's happening in different parts of a transmission. Um, I think what I want you guys to take away from it is mostly the principles and kind of the ability to get into the details of it and, and work through an example sort of if you have to. A lot of the kind of work in protocols is, I would say, you know, 90% of just understanding the principles and what the protocol does at a high level. But then once in a while, you, you'll end up isolating a part of the protocol where I, I think this doesn't work. I think this doesn't work as well as I think. I think there's a problem there. Um, and then you do need to kind of, you know, look at some measurement graphs, look at some data that's coming in, compare it to the protocol definition and kind of grind your way to some inconsistency or at least to kind of walking through the protocol to make sure it does what you think it does. Um, so that's kind of the high overview of, of why we're doing this. Um, so if you think of congestion, basically this is what it looks like. Um, how would you characterize congestion? Like what does congestion mean to you? Like a buildup of data trying to get sent. Yeah, like a buildup, right? There's a there's a buildup and it's not that it's not gonna get sent eventually, right? It's just gonna take a while to offload. Um, what you can also have, as in this image, uh, let me get a pointer going. What you can also have is that congestion being a local phenomenon, right? Where these roads are congested and these roads are completely empty, right? It's not that there's not enough capacity in the network. It's just that this capacity is not utilized because congestion is, is kind of locally blocking some traffic from going where it needs to be going, right? Like these cars want to go over here and they just can't. They're queued behind something else. Okay, um, but you can also think of it as congestion happening as when there is too much data going into the network. Um, you know, you can have kind of like a general congestion in the network, but usually it will localize to, to a few places um, or to some set of flows that are, that are bugging the network down, right? And then if you think of the effect of congestion is going to be delay, right? Because packets need to make, to the, make it to the front of the queue. Um, but it, also, it will also be packet loss where there's too much data coming into the buffer and there's no more space in the buffer and uh, those packets end up being not accepted into the buffer, which means they're just, just being lost, they're just being rejected. All right, obviously this is not something that happens um, on road networks. You don't lose packets on the road network in the same way. You can just delete cars, um, but it does happen in, in uh, networks or communication networks rather. Okay. So um, we can start thinking of congestion in the sort of idealized scenario where we have two senders and two receivers. So we have a flow from A to C and a flow from um, B to D. There is some sending rate, which is, let's call this lambda in, which is basically how many packets are going into this network per second. And then we have um, basically good put or throughput. Um, I guess I'm not specifying here what layer we're measuring this at, but basically how many packets are arriving at the destination can be taken out by the application layer, okay? So um, ideally we would have uh, lambda in being equal to lambda out, but if there's congestion, this doesn't happen. For example, when these two uh, nodes are over sending, right? Maybe packets are going to get lost from here in this queue as it fills up, and then one will not equal the other. Um, or, you can even you can idealize it and say, well, these router queues are going to have infinite space, right? They're never there's never going to be packet loss, right? And then you're basically just going to get to delay and kind of um, um, the sort of lambda out will be limited by the network capacity R. Okay, so let's look at some um, graphs here. So we have lambda in, which is basically the sending rate as it increases and then lambda out, which is the receiving rate as it increases, okay? The capacity of this router or the outgoing links is R. So when we have two flows in this network, um, you can increase the capacity from whatever, the sending rate from zero to R over two, and then what the clients can get out of it is basically R over two, 
right? R is the capacity, there are two clients. So if both of the lambda ins are the same, each client, each receiver should get R over two in terms of throughput. Clear? Clear enough. All right, I see some knobs, great. All right, so here's the weird thing that happens. You can increase lambda in to whatever you want, right? But you will never increase the delivery rate beyond R over two, because that's as much that's as much data as it can come out of this router. Okay, so as you're increasing, as you increase lambda in up to R over two, your lambda out also increases, and then it basically hits this R over two. So it doesn't matter how much you increase lambda in, you're still not going to deliver any more data per unit of time. Right? Again, this is based on unlimited unlimited buffer space. The other thing that happens is because we have unlimited buffers, buffer space, as we're increasing um, lambda in, your the queue at this buffer will start growing, right? And as you're sending more data in that can be carried out over time, the length of this buffer will become infinite, right? So your queuing delay will become infinite because some packet that's going into the queue needs to get past an infinite number of packets to get to the front of the queue and be transmitted. Yeah. So just kind of some general idea of, 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 how, of how congestion happens, yeah. kind of like an idealized model of congestion. All right, so let's look at some scenarios. Um, first question is, uh, I want you guys to think about per connection throughput. So basically this graph, this is per connection throughput. Um, and let's just work on the per connection throughput. Um, when buffers are finite, okay, and senders magically know when routers, when the router has empty buffer space and send only when space is available in the buffer. Okay, so you have magic feedback in that the senders can know exactly when the router queue starts to fill up and only send data when there is space in that buffer to send data into. So we don't we don't have infinite buffers in practice. We need to deal with finite buffers, and um, the first level solution is to use magic, as always, which is to just assume clients can't uh, will will not send packets that will get lost because there's no buffer space. All right, so I'll give you guys a minute to figure out what this per connection throughput graph would look like based on this assumption. All right, let's see, let's see what you have lines up with what I have. Okay, this is what I have. Um, why is that, right? So we know that the router cannot deliver more than our data out, right? And so per client, the output data is going to be R over two, right? So if the clients know how much space is in the buffer, right? They know when there is capacity, when the, when the router has capacity to forward, which means that they will not effectively forward more than, send more than R over two in terms of input data, right? Because if they were sending more than R, than R over two, 
then they will start getting packet loss and right? the, the buffer would start overflowing. Right, so this is kind of like what we want. Well, I suppose, kind of, uh, yeah, I was curious um, why it wouldn't just be a flat line because if it knew exactly how much data it could send, could it just always have that maximum amount sent so it doesn't have that ramp up? Um, or am I just miss or thinking about this wrong? I mean, the, the client could send less, right? It doesn't need to send um, R over two. That's it. Yeah, I mean, if if uh, if you assume that clients just send whatever else they can, your graph could be just a point here, and that's fine too. Right. We we are really interested in this region, right? This region <laughs> yeah. here is not is not all that interesting. All right. Next question. Sender resends packets only when they are lost, not just delayed, due to buffers getting. Or, or being full and packets being lost. All right, so we are sending some data. So the clients are sending some data to the router. Um, they may, they don't know exactly what's in the router buffer, right? That's magic. So we don't know that. But uh, when a packet gets lost because it doesn't fit into the buffer, they magically know that somehow and they uh, resend that one packet that got lost. Are these graphs that we're drawing similar to the ones that are on the homework, like the TCP Reno and the TCP mm. Tahoe? Uh, no, we will get to those for sure. Okay, thank you. They are, um, uh, all right, I'm going to stick with no on it. <laughs> They're based on similar principles, but uh, uh, yeah, I, I'll, I will go over those other graphs explicitly so you guys know how to deal with the homework question. Great, thanks. All right, let's see if you have something like this. Okay. So when we're increasing the sending rate, right? Initially, these kind of tracks the, the output rate as well. Now, what happens is that as both of the senders are approaching R over two input rate, okay, we do, we are starting to get some losses in that queue, okay? And so when they're sending at the rate R over two, okay, this accounts for losses. When they then start retransmitting packets, now they have, they're sending at R over two plus the retransmitted packets, so they're actually generating more than R over two traffic. Okay, and now they can start delivering some of those packets as well. Okay, so basically as we're increasing R over two, 
eventually we have to oversend by a lot to eventually get to R over to delivery rate. Now, you know, your delay will be very, very high right now because you're working with, with queues. So this is a bit theoretical, but, um, or, or bit asymptotic rather, right? But um, you, you can asymptotically get to this R over two. The last scenario um, is looks something like this, okay? And the idea here is that retransmission happens not just um, as a result of loss, okay, but also as a result of, of uh, premature timeout, right? So we talked about TCP timeouts, and when the timeout is set incorrectly, right, or when you guess wrong on how long to wait, you can retransmit a packet that hasn't actually been lost, right? And so even when we're sending kind of more than, than R over two um, data, some of those transmissions are duplicate packets, and so you don't asymptotically get to R over two. All right, now this isn't something I'm gonna test you guys on, because it's kind of time consuming to figure out exactly exactly what's happening. The purpose of this is to, um, to start thinking about congestion, about solutions to congestion, First in an idealized setting where you have infinite buffers, but then you also end up with infinite delay. So that's not good. Infinite delay is very bad, right? So we do have to constrain buffer size. We also need to do it because we don't have infinite memory, okay? So once we constrain buffers to something finite, now we need to make decisions about what to do to deliver all the data or to maintain a high, a high sending rate, a high throughput, okay? We can first start with pretty powerful magical solutions just to kind of understand the principle of what we would like to do. And then we can move to kind of less powerful magic like in point number two, okay? And then we can move to kind of closer and closer to the mechanisms we can actually implement such as uh, realizing when a packet has been lost because of a timeout, because of lack of acknowledgement and then taking action. So the rest of this lecture is about taking sort of reasonable actions that you can with the information about the network that you have at, um, at the client. All right, so here's another interesting thing that can happen inside, inside a network, all right? So let's say we have this network topology, not just kind of one router, but um, a more, more complex topology where we have a, flow from A to D, this is the red flow, and then we have a flow from C to B, this is the blue flow. And what happens to the relative rates of these flows as um, lambda N increases, right? So as A and C send more and more data into the network. Right? Well, something like this happens to um, the red flow. Okay? First, as we increase the sending rate, its throughput increases and then it basically collapses. <laughs> Say, well, why is that, right? That's not what we've seen before. <laughs> why would the throughput collapse, right? This is obviously not what we want to happen in a network. And, you know, it's, it's kind of difficult to understand this behavior if you're just looking at throughput and sometimes your throughput is just bad, right? Like, why is that? What is going on? So when we have this sort of God's eye view of, of everything, we can see what's happening. So A is sending at, um, Lambda in, great, but it gets forwarded, the traffic gets forwarded at the rate R, okay? C is sending at lambda in, and then both of the flows share the outgoing capacity of uh, the second router, right, which is also R. So the most each flow can get is R over two, but that's not what the red flow is getting. Why is that? So. A is sending at lambda in to R1, but when the data arrives at R2, it is capped to the capacity of this link, which is R. Okay, so it doesn't matter how much data A is sending, eventually it arrives at R2 at the rate R. Now, C doesn't have that restriction. It can keep ramping up lambda in to whatever it wants, eventually way more than R, right? Like at the limit of the graph, it's way more. So for every packet that um, of the red flow arriving at router two, there could be thousand packets arriving of the blue flow of this router, right? And so eventually in the queue, in the outgoing queue of R2, there are mostly blue packets. Just by the ratio of those arriving so frequently. 
And so that's why when this flow is being forwarded from router two to router four, it's mostly the blue packets that are being forwarded. Right? And then, you know, and then they split and it doesn't matter. But basically here, the blue flows kind of push out or keep the, the blue packets are being dropped from the outgoing queue of R2 very, very frequently. But that's fine because they just keep getting sent back in. But whenever packets from the red flow arrive, there just is no more room in that in that buffer because it's all filled with blue. Right? So depending on when the where in the network the flow is constrained, it could have effect later on when, on what's happening to the flow, right? As it competes with other flows. Um, so this is also kind of bad, right? Because when we're sending the red flow, it doesn't really get forwarded anymore. And so all this capacity here on this router is wasted because those packets are forwarded, but then not forwarded again. And so if we have something like a green flow, right? The green flow has to now compete with the red flow, but it's dumb because the red flow doesn't go anywhere anyway. So it's just it's just kind of muscling out or or you know using half the capacity of this router um, that could be fully utilized by the by the green flow. All right. All right. So we need congestion control that doesn't create these types of situations uh, as much as possible. Right. That that um, what you would want is a congestion control protocol that allows uh, these three flows to share network resources equally or fairly. Let's just say fairly, right? whatever that means. Maybe it's not equally because of kind of how they maybe equally at each router or something, right? Something other than what's happening here. All right. So when we think about congestion control, I think a good analogy is thinking about trying to get allowance from your parents. Um, so what would be your strategy for trying to maximize the amount of allowance that you get from your parents or food money when you're at college, if you're fortunate to be funded by your parents at this point? But you just keep asking again until it gets denied. You just keep asking again until it gets denied, right? So then I want more, I want more, I want more, and eventually you hit a limit, right? But how how do you ask for more, right? Do you start at one dollar, then ask for two, then ask for three? Right? There is some like a relatively safe set of asks, and then it starts getting a little bit dicey, <laughs> right? So you don't want to waste all your time asking for the for peanuts. Right, you kind of want to get to this limit where the negotiation actually happens. Okay, so you can say binary search, right? Let's get, let's find this limit quickly, right? But binary search gets there quickly, but then you could get a no, and then while there still might be a lot of room for negotiation, right? Somewhere between the no and the and your previous ask. All right, so there's some kind of uh, we need some sort of a quick ramp up to get to the interesting part, and then like a slow progression of where you, you know, so break your parents down. Yeah, is a comment? Uh, start high, start at your maximum, like sending limit and then go down from there, just see what it'll accept. Um, okay, but then how do you go down, right? It's, it's the same, it's the same question. Right? You could you could start at a million and then go down by one dollar each day. Right? That's actually an even worse strategy because now you're not even getting money while you keep asking. Right? <clears throat> so anyway, I'm joking around, but this is um kind of the same idea, right? This it's the principles are the same. So um let's see what how much time do we have today? Uh, all right, we'll we'll go quickly through this. So Normally what we might do, what I would do is uh, kind of throw um, up the scenario where you have some network and then um, you try to design a congestion protocol for this network. Um, so we have two clients and two servers. Client one talks to server one, client two talks to server two. Um, there's some capacity of those links and the only difference in those flows for um, 
between client one and for client one and client two is that client one has less latency here than client two. Okay, and then they share some capacity here, and then these are the bottleneck links, right? And so um, you can kind of consider all these different things about how to detect congestion, um, how to define fairness, how to deal with end-to-end -end delay. Um, and maybe this is like the most interesting thing that I like to point out here is this fairness and end-to-end -end delay, right? So um, should client one and client two achieve the same rates of download in this network? Maybe, right? You might say yes. Uh, maybe they're paying the same amount, right? Um, but client one has a lower um, delay by 20 milliseconds to its server versus client two, all right? So if we have an asking strategy where let's say you start at $1 and you go up, right? You can see that if um, we ask for one more dollar in every round and it takes less time between the asks, right? The client that has less delay to the server is going to be able to ramp up its sending rate faster and effectively achieve higher throughput. Right, so uh, this is kind of weird, right? We don't want that. It's hard to control latency, or maybe this could be a problem. Someone could be just located further away, right? More far out into the country, but they should still get the same throughput as anybody else because they're still paying as much for their for their network. Right? So how do we provide fairness of throughput in spite of things that, um, in spite of connections being different? Um, it's like a real problem in networks. You can't just assume that all the clients are the same. All right, so we can think about two types of network of congestion control mechanisms, two type of approaches. Right? One is an end-to-end -end approach where there is no explicit feedback from the network. Everything happens between the end hosts. All right? um, and then you can infer that congestion is happening from things like uh, packet loss. Right? If there is congestion, you know that packets will start getting lost from routers, from um, um, router sending queues. And so if there's a loss, it's likely that there's congestion. Um, or if the packet delay is increasing, that means, well, it's probably spending more time in, in router queues, which, meaning, which means that congestion is imminent. Packet loss is a little bit weird because it works very well in wired networks. But as we'll see when we talk about wireless, packets can get lost for reasons of interference. And that may have nothing to do with congestion. And if you start treating those losses, from interference as congestion, your throughput is going to suffer from it. I'll get into that more later, but for now I think loss, you can think of loss as loss happening only in router queues and being an indication of congestion. Right? You can also think of congestion control as being implemented in the network, where the router itself is uh, noticing how much, how, um, uh, how its queues are filling up, and can mark certain packets, right? Use some um, IP or TCP header bits to, um, uh, or bits in the IP or TCP headers to say, hey, this packet is experiencing congestion. It spent some time in a queue, right? Um, or it could also send some packets explicitly to notify senders of congestion being, being imminent or, or that it's happening, right? So the network assisted solutions are a bit closer to the magic solutions that I discussed earlier, right? um, where you know you are creating some sort of feedback that clients normally wouldn't have access to. All right. So when we talk about TCP congestion control, um, there are uh, there's a few slides and they kind of get more and more detailed as we go on. So the basic principle is additive increase and multiplicative decrease. Right, so we can uh, we have a graph here over time of um, congestion window size. So you can think of congestion window as basically how much data can we keep in flight? How many packets can a sender put into the network without gaining any acknowledgments? Right, we can send one packet at a time. We can send two packets at a time, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The more packets at a time we're sending or back to back, right, the higher our sending rate is going to be, right, up to basically uh, the capacity of the network, like the physical capacity of a, of a link. So 
over time, this congestion window value can increase by adding one, right? Let's say in each round trip, we add one more, we send one pack or we send whatever, five packets, now we send six, now we send seven, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And eventually we notice a congestion event, maybe a packet is lost, um, and then we can decrease the sending rate heavily, right? And start this ramp out again. Now, why increase heavily? The idea is that if you have a lot of flows kind of reaching this capacity, right, it makes sense for one flow or a few of them to start backing off significantly and leaving the other flows undisturbed. Right? Um, and then it allows those flows to kind of fill in their remaining capacity. And then maybe next time congestion happens, some other flow ends up backing off and then ends up doing this backing off event. Um, so, Additive increase, multiplicative decrease, and the number of packets that TCP keeps in flight is governed by both the congestion window and the receive window. Receive window is, if you guys remember, the window from flow control, TCP flow control, which is basically how much space in the buffer the receiver has. And the congestion windows, we'll talk about how it's how it's calculated in a second, is how much. TCP thinks it can send into the network based on the level of congestion. Right? So the actual number of packets in flight, the number of unacknowledged packets or window size is governed as the min of these two mechanisms, the min of congestion control and flow control. All right, let's bring more detail into this discussion. So here we have round trip times. So one round trip time, two round trip time, basically how long it takes to send a packet back and forth. So send a packet and get an acknowledgement, okay? And here we have congestion window size. We'll assume that, that the receive window size is very large, much larger than this. We don't have to worry about it. We'll just talk about congestion window. Now, what I mentioned about the allowance is that we want to get to uh, a reasonable, interesting uh, space where the, negotiate, where the tight negotiation can start happening. So what we'll do is we'll kind of double the sending rate in each RTT to get to some threshold. I'll talk about this threshold in a second. Um, and then we start increasing, not doubling the sending rate in each round trip time, but increasing it by one. Okay. So this is called slow start, which is kind of a misnomer because you're actually sending data much more quickly or you're starting, you're ramping up pretty quickly. Um, but it's a slow start because it's starting from like a slow sending rate. So that's why it's called slow start. Um, and then you have this um, additive increase, multiplicative decrease or congestion avoidance. That's another name for this mechanism. So you have slow start and congestion avoidance where we're increasing sending rate by one in each round trip. Then you could have a loss event such as a timeout on, on a particular acknowledgement. And now we're cutting the sending rate to one and we jump back into the slow start. But now the threshold value is set to half of the window size before the loss event, right? So we can kind of get quickly to half, and we know that the kind of capacity of the network is somewhere here, right? So we don't want to kind of blow past it. We want to get quickly to some area and then start kind of probing the network again by sending more and more. Now, if we have a less severe loss event, such as three duplicate acts, okay, we lost the packet, so we don't get an acknowledgement, but then other packets are getting through, and so the receiver is acknowledging those packets by sending us, yep, got byte 100, got byte 100, got byte 100, three times, okay? We know that one loss occurred, but packets are still getting through, and so maybe we don't need to cut our sending rate so hard, we can just cut it kind of in half and go right into this congestion avoidance stage. That's the general principle. Um, feel free to ask me some questions right now. I know it's kind of confusing and, and there's one more slide that gets into the detail of it, or two more slides actually, but I just wanna check in that um, if you're feeling lost, this is the time to uh, get yourself unstuck. So I had a quick question on how you figure out the uh, MSS. Is that just what you are starting at when the TCP connection begins? So in this case, it would be one. The, the MSS, okay. 
the maximum segment size is um, the amount of data you can send in an IP packet. All right, we'll get into this when we talk about IP. Um, actually, hmm. let me back up. Maximum segment size is what the link layer says you can send in a link layer frame. We didn't talk about link layer yet. Um, so that translates to then how much, how big an IP packet you can form, and then how much payload you can have inside an IP packet, uh, which then translates to how much payload you can have inside a TCP packet. So um, we, we'll, look at, we'll look at some numbers for that, but basically can think of it as MSS is the largest packet you can form. Does that is, make sense? Oh, yeah, go ahead. Is that during the slow start, or is that just the largest packet that you can send during the entire connection? It's the largest packet that your network will take uh, during the entire connection. Okay, that makes more sense. Thank you. Mm -hmm, yep. So, is that dynamically um, chosen, or is that like? No, set? no. It's a function. It's a function of the of protocol implementation. So okay. um, pretty much all the packets, uh, all the IP packets are 1,460 bytes. Um, okay, that makes it sense. It doesn't have to be that way, it's just how it is. Um, now, uh, I mean, you could you know, redesign the protocols and set it to whatever you want, right? But that's kind of where we are with the parameters right now in the internet. Um, if you're building your own custom network, like you know, setting up your own ethernet, you can kind of set it to whatever you want to. If you're building a data center network, you can set it to whatever you want to, whatever makes sense. So you can always send a smaller packet. You can put a one byte in a packet payload, but you can't ever put more than 1,400 bytes into an IP, uh, into a TCP payload that goes through the internet. Yep. Um, great, great question. Other questions? All right, let's move on. A few more minutes. Okay, so this is the graph that everyone wants to know what is going on. All right, so we have slow starts. Um, we have TCP Tahoe, which is like the vanilla TCP. Okay, we start with slow start. Congestion window is equal to one maximum segment size. Okay, so that's our congestion window in segments. Um, you can translate that to bytes um, or use maximum segment size. You know, it's just a conversion. All right. Now, for every acknowledgement we get, we're going to increase the congestion window by one or increment. Okay. Effectively, this means doubling the congestion window size every RTT. Here's why. First, I send one packet. Okay. I get an acknowledgement. Now I increase congestion window by one. So in the next round, I send two packets. Now I get two acknowledgements and I increase my congestion window by one for every ax, so by two. That becomes four. Now I send four packets, get four ax, now I send eight packets. Okay, so we end up with um, a, a, a uh, exponential increase. Right? So um, if a timeout occurs, if we have a loss event, the rule is I'm going to set the slow start threshold, our congestion window over two. Kind of talked about it um, over here. Oh, sorry. So congestion window, the threshold gets set to, to uh, congestion window over two. That's this. And I'm going to send my congestion window to one uh, MSS. Okay, so uh, we're sending, sending, sending. Now there's a loss event here. I end up cutting my slow start threshold to, to this over two, which is here. And uh, congestion window goes to one. If we are um, in congestion avoidance, there's some difference between the between TCP Tahoe and TCP Reno. So we're gonna start congestion avoidance when congestion window equals slow start threshold. So we're increasing the sending rate, congestion window then re reaches slow start threshold. And now we're starting to increase uh, the sending rate or the congestion window by one for every round trip time. So not every act that comes back, but one for every round trip time. And that means we're increasing it more slowly. Okay. Um, if a timeout happens, basically nothing is getting through the network, there's just loss, um, 
we're going to set the slow start threshold to congestion window over two and congestion window to one MSS, which basically means we restart the transmission from here. But, and here's the difference between TCP Reno and TCP Tahoe, when there are three duplicate acts, acts which is a less severe loss, basically one packet got lost, but there are other packets still going through that are getting acknowledged, um, what TCP Reno will do is not kind of go all the way down here and start sending from, from one, but it will still set the slow start threshold to congestion window over two, okay? And now it will enter the fast recovery or basically congestion avoidance by setting congestion window to slow start threshold, okay? Plus three times maximum segment size, which accounts for the three duplicate acts. And so basically it will start from slow start threshold plus one, two, three MSS, and then go into uh, congestion avoidance. Yeah, so it'll back off a little bit and then try to find a uh, more accurate rate. Okay. And so that's basically the fast recovery of TCP Reno. Questions? How do you set um, the threshold initially? Because I see it's set to eight, which is half of 16, but how did we choose 16 at the very beginning? Um, that is a good question. Um, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I can look that up. Um, let me make a note. Okay. Yeah, I think it's, there's, all right, my, my guess is that there is some default value um, or, yeah, my, I'm going to guess there's some default value and what it is, I don't know. Um, and if that's not the case, I'll let you guys know. Other questions? And so basically the big difference between Reno and Tahoe is Reno just has that faster um, recovery rate. Um, I'm assuming the reason we don't use Reno for everything in that case would just be because you have like a higher loss chance or is there is there something along those lines? Good, good question. So um, we started with TCP Tahoe basically. I mean, like a very early version. And then people said, well, let's not collapse the throughput if we have just one packet getting lost. So that's when TCP Reno got born. Then, oh, so this is, um, here's a diagram kind of showing the transition between the different states. Um, it's in your book, might be helpful for your homework. Um, but then there's TCP Vegas, which does something else. And then there's, uh, and then there's other flavors of TCP, such as Cubic, which is used in data centers. I will get into those uh, next week because we're out of time here, uh, or not next week on Friday, I'm sorry. But this is kind of the basic TCP, TCP Reno, uh, TCP Tahoe, and then there are other improvements to TCP that um, try to hit the same principles, but they don't always work as well. There's an interesting thing that happens in terms of fairness that we'll get into. So these are just the first two flavors of TCP. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Is there a reason why oh. all of these are named after cities in Nevada? <laughs> uh, I'm sure there is. I don't know what that is, though. Yeah, I was just like, uh, OK. Um, yeah, there's a there's a bunch of these naming conventions like, you know, Intel chips are named after cities or we're named after cities. Um, Android uh, is named after desserts. What's that? Oh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, Android is named after desserts, which I think they gave up on. Uh, sad. Yeah, so I don't know. Cool. Okay. Cool. Um, so with TCP Tahoe, it basically just like starts over essentially if it gets three duplicate acts it goes all yep. the way back down and then yeah dcp tahoe anything happens any loss happens and, it starts over right 
And is that why is CCP Reno more implemented now because it doesn't have to start all the way back from the beginning? Um, or is it just depending? Yes, on TCP different? Reno is better in that sense. It achieves okay. it achieves higher throughputs. Okay, great. Yep. All right, great. Let's end here. Um, yep, I will uh, post this on on uh, YouTube so you guys can watch it later. And um, I hope to see many of you in office hours. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.